Those elderly people, my friends, colleagues, everyone, thank you for coming here. We have prepared a small timeline of the history of India's independence, the history of India. I hope you guys would like it. Please uh, allow us to start. Thank you so much. India is a land of diversity, a land where people of various origins have blended in to form one united nation. Since the dawn of time, settlers all around the world have migrated to India and made her their home. And India, like a perfect mother, embraced all of them close to her heart and let her blood flow through their veins. The Aryans from Central Europe later joined the Dravidians, the oldest inhabitants of India, 5,000 years ago. Then came the Macedonians from the Mediterranean, Arabs from the Middle East, the Hans from Mongolia, the Mughals from Persia, the Siamese from Southeast Asia, and the list goes on. Then the British arrived, who shaped India to what it is now. With time, the borders of this country changed, and so did the rulers. Some made fortunes, some built kingdoms and became emperors, and some faded in time. Nevertheless, they all had one thing in common. They loved this country. People migrating to India didn't just enrich the culture of this country, but also made India one of the most diverse countries in the world. Since the dawn of time, invaders ruled this country. From the Aryans to the Mughals, they all had settled down here and the resources of this country stayed within the territories of this country. However, when the British came to India, they had something else in mind. The early explorers found India as a land of fortune, as they become rich by trading spices, gold, and indigo. This led to the formation of a trading company in early 1600 called the East India Company. It became the face of British rule in India and throughout the world for the next 200 years. It was the dauntless exploration coupled with the greed for glory and gold that gripped most of Europe then and the rest of the world was sacrificed to appease that hunger. After the death of the last Mughal emperor in early 1700s, the Hindustan lacked a strong ruler. The company that initially started as mere traders took advantage of nation's weakness and grew greedy. Gradually, they started intervening into state and political affairs in the Battle of Plassey, the British defeated the Shirajuddullah and obtained the East. The northern part was seized from the Sikh warriors and the West was captured from the Marathas. Finally, in the South, the might of Tipu Sultan was defeated. By the end of 1800, the company had completely taken over the Indian subcontinent, either by means of battle or by means of victory. Barely 3,000 British men mastered over 30 million Indian people. More than 200 years of deception, trickery, humiliation, and thundering had ignited the flames of revolution in the minds of Indian people. The common person starved to death to guarantee more profits for the company. The kings, the queens, and the noble men were turned to puppets of rejection. The Indian soldiers recruited to companies' protection sacrificed their lives for nothing in return. The revolt was the only thing that the people had in their mind. The revolt triggered where the fates of the soldiers were disrespected. Revolution spread like a conflagration from military barracks to common men. Mati Mangal Pandey led the revolution in the eastern part and fought his way to ultimate sacrifice. Lakshmi Bai, Chansi Kirani led her own army to the battlefield and kept the spirit of freedom alive in Midwestern India. She organized the revolt to bring freedom to her people. It was then the concept of motherland was born. The last Mughal emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, wanting to claim his territory back, led the battle in the northern part of India. It seemed like India was in renaissance. Since only parts of the nation erupted, the company was able to contain it. Regardless, the revolt had shaken the company from its core, and the queen was proclaimed as the Empress of India. To voice the anger of the people without violence, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League were created. 
For the next 50 years, the British Raj ruled India by dividing the people based on their religious beliefs. That was the silence before the storm. In the early 20th century, nationalist movements started to flare up. India grew tired of the slavery and wanted to revolt again. The anti-British protest grew more national, from Chittagong to Punjab, from Delhi to Kanyakumari, people started waking up from the hundred years of slumber. Small groups formed in every locality. Several national heroes surfaced up from the mass and performed their duties to serve their country, to fight for freedom. People participated openly in rallies and protest marches. And then something happened that shocked an entire nation. A garden in Punjab quickly turned into a graveyard when General Dyer and his soldiers fired machine guns at everyone that was present there. Women, children, young and old, everyone. The Jalian Balabagh incident is considered one of the most inhuman acts in the history of India. People's faith was shaken. The protest grew sore. Ramindranath Tagore, as a voice of disapproval, returned the title to knighthood to the British Kingdom. Brother Singh and his men protested in the courtroom to ensure that the whole world hears their voice. Binoy, Badal, and Dinesh sacrificed their lives in order to take revenge. A part of the nation believed in violent protest and in freedom in the battlefield. More young men and women joined the motto. The nation was filled with people who had freedom in their spirit and nothing could stop them. Their lives could be taken but not their spirit. Subhash Chandra Bose broke away from the Congress and demanded fight for freedom. While on house arrest, he fled to Germany, Singapore, and Japan to gain alliance with India's independence. He was able to lead the Indian National Army, mainly consisting of the political prisoners. The army marched the path to freedom from the Northeastern Corridor. He constantly reminded people, give me blood and I'll give you freedom. I do not know how many of us who are going to participate in the coming battle will survive to see India free. But whether we survive or not, whether we individually live to see India free or not, we are confident that India shall be free. We are confident that anglo American imperialism will be wiped out of India. We are confident that the menace that now hangs over 